بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وبه نستعين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستهديه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أرسله بالحق بشيرا ونذيرا بين يدي الساعة من يطع الله ورسوله فقد رشد ومن يعص الله ورسوله فلا يضر إلا نفسه ولا يضر الله شيئا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد Our topic today is about Nur al-Din, Mahmoud, the son of Imad al-Zinki. Who is this man? When was he born? In his time, he was facing the Crusaders. The Crusaders. Number one. He was facing, in his time, the Romans, a superpower. He was facing, in his time, hypocrites, Muslim leaders who are hypocrites, just like our leaders today who even used to give parts of their land to the Romans and the Crusaders just to leave them in power or to give them a small part of the land. Just like us today, identical. Crusaders. Crusaders. Romans. In addition to the Romans, he was facing the Muslim hypocrites. Not only that, he was facing just like we face those deviant cults that we have today. Those companion cursors, those Fatimiyin, Abaydiyin. The Shia. He was facing those who were trying to spread their evil belief. They had one of their powerfulest nations that they ever had in their life in Egypt. This was in 511 after the death of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He's born. His father is a governor of Halab. He was in charge of Halab, but he was a righteous man. He fought the Crusaders. And he did it. wasn't victorious over them very much, but he did stop, try to stop them. And he raised his son very well. A hero can only raise a hero. A coward raises a coward. There's exceptions, but this is a general rule. This hero raised his son. I want you to pay. I'm not talking about these stories so we can listen to them and enjoy ourselves listening to them only. No. Yes, alhamdulillah, we enjoy our history. We get out of this misery we're in to this bright past that we had and enjoy ourselves. Yes. However, we need to apply that on ourselves. Every one of you got to be a Nuri Deen. Every one of you got to be a Nuri Deen in his house. Everyone got to be a Nuri Deen in his community. Everyone got to be a Nuri Deen to raise the flag of La ilaha illallah on this earth. That's what, you're waiting, that's what you, you were brought on this earth for. We weren't brought on this earth to make them cars or be engineers. Although education is very good and necessary. But that's not our purpose in life. Our purpose in life is to spread the word of La ilaha illallah throughout this globe. So his father raised him young. How did he raise him? The first thing he started with him is knowledge. Knowledge. The halakat we have. The fifth, tawheed, tafsir. Those people who attend these halakat, we're not preparing you just for knowledge. We're preparing you for one day to be an uriddin. If you can't be an uriddin, you better make your son an uriddin. Yes. That's our purpose. That's our goal. We don't go around making 10 or 12 halakat a week, consistent halakat a week, and just let it evaporate out of our mind. We're doing the same way that Nur al-Din and his brothers and people like him achieve victory on this earth. His father raised him. How did he raise him? Knowledge. Quran. He starts out with Quran. Tafsir. Tawheed. Aqeedah. Everything. Until he made him love knowledge. Not only love knowledge, but love sunnah. This hero, when he took power after, who killed his father, was some of his slaves betrayed his father. Now the crusaders. See, the hypocrites always are a problem in this ummah. He fought the crusaders. They never harmed him. The ones who harmed him are his own slaves. His own slaves killed him. So who takes the leadership now back then? His son, Nuruddin, the one we're talking about. He takes leadership 
but he has knowledge in his mind. You know what the first thing he does? What would you be thinking the first thing he did when you got the Romans trying to destroy the Islamic Khilafah, the Abbas Khilafah, which was only a Khilafah by name, it had no power. Just by, they couldn't even stand that, just a Khilafah by name. When you had the Crusaders come in and invade it, when you had Palestine, Beit al-Maqdis, our holy land, just like today, under the hands of the Crusaders with massacres, everything. Just like we have the Jews today, massacring and bombing and killing and genocide. They had the Crusaders back then at that time. What do you think the first thing he did when he took leadership? Well, I would think he'd have to fall asleep. That's what I think. But you know what the first thing, one of the first things he did? <coughs> Was a back, a stab to those Shia. The first thing he said, no more hayya ala khayr al-amal. They say hayya, hayya ala khayr al-amal in their prayer. He said that's abolished. Hayya ala salah, hayya ala salah, hayya ala khayr al-amal goes away. He loved the sunnah. Not only that, you know what else he did? After never would you ever see him in his groups of people except with hadith, Quran, seerah, anything good in his discussion. That's all he would have in his, when, his, uh, when his colleagues would meet together, all he would have is words of knowledge. No wasting of time, no gossip, no backbiting. You know, uh, they, one time they told him, uh, uh, they told him a hadith of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu And at the end of this hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu smiled. At the end of the hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu smiled. So usually, and I know this when I lecture, when I say hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam smiled, I, I look at the audience, they smile as well. It's a sunnah. You want to imitate the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and especially when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam smiles, there's really something behind it to smile. And it's sunnah. And he's sitting there with a frown. Nuri Deen, why aren't you smiling? You follow the sunnah precisely. How come you're not smiling? This young boy who lived, you know how he lived? 58 years. 58 years of his life. Well, our fathers and grandfathers look more than this, in 80 now, in 90, they can't do not 1%, even, even 0.001% of what this man do. Why can't you smile? And by the way, his jihad life was 28 consistent years, nearly day after day of jihad, 28 years of his 58 years life. He was born in 511, he died in 569, after the death of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Why aren't you smiling, Nur din You know why he's not smiling? The worry of the Ummah out there, they're being attacked, the Muslims are being attacked. How can I smile? How can I smile? When the Ummah is being annihilated and killed. I'm afraid Allah will ask me about that on the Judgment Day. They know, you know, you know, among the story, you know, is how much he loved the Sunnah. Meaning when he didn't smile, he shocked everyone. The second thing, you know, is his worry is over the Ummah. His mind is not with him. In fact, they said he rarely ever smiled throughout his life. How can you smile? How can we smile, Wallahi al-Azim, when the massacres of the Ummah is going on like it is going on today? Every day, you hear houses being bombed in Palestine with the people in them. Every day, Wallah, I was reading a letter. Yes, I think it was today or yesterday, where your Chechenian brothers, your Chechenian brothers are sending a letter. You guys are in winter. Look at you, all of you wearing jackets. You put your jackets over there. You wear socks. You close the door real quick when you come in. It's cold and we have the heat. Imagine your brothers who have none of that. They said, fuck, a jacket. Wallahi, they're begging. They're begging, they don't have none of that. And how could we smile? How could we happy when, when this is our brothers? No, it didn't. It was instilled in his heart. How could I do that? How could I smile when my brother's over there with nothing to cover his shoes or cover his body or the sky is the ceiling? How could I do that? So Nur al-Din refused to smile. You know how strict he was in Sunnah? You say the hero that I'm going to tell you what he did. The hero, he heard that the Prophet ﷺ used to put his sword in a unique way. Around his chest and around his stomach. In a unique way that they used to do back then. The way he used to do it and his army used to do it was different. He heard it in a discussion in his, in his house. Who said it's a Sunnah? It's a Sunnah of Ada. You know, if you want to imitate the Prophet because you love him, you can ask him for that. But it's not a Sunnah, you know, of Ibadah. So, as soon as he heard the Hadith, he changed his sword on the spot in order the whole army, all the army, change your sword. You see that little tiny Sunnah? But see what that little tiny Sunnah is going to make of this man. Those little tiny things, the smile, the Hadith, the Hayya ala Salah, Hayya ala Salah, what it made out of this hero. Because his father taught him knowledge as a young boy. He raised him as a young boy with knowledge. And he made him a hero that the world, I say, Wallahi, I read the books from the time of Nuri Din till now. 1,000 years almost, almost 1,000 years. Bring me someone like him. Even his students, and I tell you, 
Heroes only bring heroes. The student to Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi. I was looking for Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi's history, looking in the volumes of books, when I fell upon his teacher. Who knows Nur al-Din? Who knows Nur al-Din? Rarely anyone knows him. But he's a hero that this man should be someone you look up to. These are the people we look up to. These are the people we follow in their footsteps. What did he do? Let's talk about his heroism. How heroic he was. He used to go as a leader. As a leader, you don't have to fight. And usually leaders don't fight. They're commanders. They direct and they set. No, when it was his turn, he was in the front lines of the battlefield every single time. Every single battlefield, he was in the front lines of it. Not only that, when his father taught him knowledge, he didn't just teach him knowledge. You know why he taught him with knowledge? Physical strength. He was so physically strong that he takes the size of two. If they take two bags on their back, two bags, he'd carry four. They carry four, he carry eight. He carries the double of a normal person, and he's the leader. He doesn't have to. When they told him, you know, they, they found him crying one time. Who did he, why are you crying? He said, they attempted to kill me so many times and they couldn't kill me. He's crying. Why are you crying? So told you, that's good. You know, I'd be happy. I got along the life. He said, that means that Allah doesn't like me because he didn't choose me as to be a martyr. You see that? You see how his father raised him? Allah doesn't like me because when they told him, Nur al-Din, rest. Mahmoud. Nur al-Din Mahmoud is his name. Rest. You shouldn't be fighting with us. You know if they kill you, it's a defeat for this ummah. We may be down and we may be with nothing without you. He looked at him. He said, you guys have no... He's talking to scholars. He only kept around in scholars, not bums. He kept... He looked around and said, you guys got no manners with Allah? You guys got no manners with Allah? He said, why? He said, who's Mahmoud? Who's Mahmoud? Who's Nur al-Din? How did Allah save Islam before Nur al-Din? He will save it without Nur al-Din. Nur al-Din is nothing. Look how humble he was to Allah. Give me 1,000 heroic men, and I will not, not let nothing stand in front of me. 1,000. That was the same score. Give me 1,000 men, that's all I need. That's all he needs. 1,000 men who destroyed the crusaders and the Romans and everything. Every time he go, I need 1,000 men under his command. When he went and he seen the world is coming at him, they seen he's a danger. He had to unite the world. I tell you, there was a small town. Every small town had a leader. So he sent letters to the leader. Najm al-Din, Nur al-Din, Naim al-Din. All these leaders, that's how they used to call themselves. They sent them letters. We're being attacked by the crusaders, by the Romans, by the hypocrites of the leaders of Muslims who give them the land. We're being attacked by them. So you must help us. He sent a letter to the leader. Letters to every khatib of the Jum'ah. Learn, learn, because this is what you have to do one day, inshallah. Unite this ummah. Every leader, what's he going to do? I got no choice but to join him. Some of them were saying, this man's a crazy man. His prayer and worshiping made him crazy. What's he doing? He wants the whole world? What's he trying to do? He's a crazy man. One of them was Fakhr al-Din. He sat by his advisors. He got the letter. His advisor said, what do you think about this letter? He said, you join him. He said, no, I'm sitting. I'm going to be sitting. He said, the best decision. We're going to be sitting. No, no reason to fight. His prayer and his fasting got to his mind. They made him crazy. He's a crazy man now. Because he prayed and fasted and made dua a lot. The next morning, that same Fakhr al-Din is out in the street calling, Hayya al jihad. He said, well, yesterday you were just telling us you. He said, you know what he said? He said, if I don't join him, what's this you going to write about me? My people are going to rebel against me because this ummah needs leaders. This ummah needs leaders and that's what we lack. We're like ummah, we're like sheep who go in front of anyone who leads us. We need true leaders abiding by the Quran and the Sunnah and everyone in himself has to be a leader as well. He said, what's history going to write about me? My, my people will rebel against me. Yes. And they joined him, nearly everyone joined him, and he united, he united, most of the, as you're going to see at the end, how much he united, small little town, Halab he started off with, nearly half of the Arabic world, or more than the Arabic world, belonged under his control, he united him. One time he's fighting, and on the front line next to him is a man, an arrow shoot, gets in his eye, and he looks at him, he says, brother, wallahi, he's a man who's worried about his eye, he said, wallahi, if you know, what well, Allah saved you of Ajar, You'd wish the other one goes out as well. He went one time, and he has behind him a man is the front of a leader called Naim al-Din. Naim al-Din was a hypocrite. He was a hypocrite. When the crusaders came to him, he said, take my land, use it as you wish. Just like Saudi Arabia today, just like Kuwait today, just like they do today. Use our lands as you wish. Bases. Kill the Muslims. Hypocrites. These are like Naim al-Din. When he came, 
he took, he gave him the land to the crusaders and he said use it as you wish. They used it. Now, he's coming after them, Nur al-Din, to take it over. And you know who has behind him? After they won and took it over again, he looks behind him and he has his son, the leader's son. He said, thank Allah, you have two blessings. We all have one blessing, you have two. Two blessings. One is that we're all victorious, that's our blessing. Your blessing is that man you saved from hellfire, your own father. You may be less than that what she's going through in hellfire. He took down 50, 50 of the biggest qal'as, big strongholds. I mean, if you've been to the Arabic world, there still remains of them. They're so huge, so well mounted, so well secured. He took 50, one after the other, one after the other. When he got to some areas like a sham, he surrounded a sham. Sham is pretty big. And first time it didn't work out. Second time, didn't work out. First time the leader said, I'm going to give up and work with you. I'll be side by side. And they went and fought the Romans together. He had, he had from Turkey, from Turkey all the way to Yemen. From Turkey to Yemen. He started with Halab. He had from Turkey to Yemen. From Egypt to Iraq. From Egypt to Iraq, from Turkey to Yemen, under his control. Yes, this is the hero we're talking about today. But this is not only aspect of his life. Was he only a hero? Was he only knowledgeable? He spread justice throughout his country. He gave the scholars salaries just so they can sit and teach people. He took care of the orphans. He took care of the widows. Anything that was needed, he took. One time they told him, they told him, Nur al-Din, your army is getting big. You need to pay for it, you know. You need to finance it more. Otherwise the army is not going to work. He said, where do you want me to get the money from? There's no money. There's no wealth. They said, you know those people you pay? The orphans, the widows, the poor people? Just take a little bit of their salary and give it to your soldiers. He says, no way. No way, wallahi, that will never happen. Why? Look at this unique statement and tell me what it means. He said, their arrows never miss. They fight when I'm not there. Your arrows miss sometimes. Your arrows miss sometimes. And you only fight when I'm around you. What does he mean by this statement? What does he mean? Doesn't need a genius. He said, their arrows don't miss. They fight when I'm not around. Your arrows miss sometimes. And you only fight when I'm around you. He means there's dua. Their arrows go to Allah. They make the dua. We become victorious because of their dua. He didn't just depend on his power. It was dua that made him what he is. Their dua. Their arrows to Allah. Ya Allah, give him victory. Ya Allah. You think those widows are not going to be making dua? Those orphans, those young people, the poor, the knowledgeable, they're going to make it. That's the arrows. He needed that more than he needed the physical strength. That's what he was talking about. He was a hero. He was a humble man.